What is up, everybody? Today, we're going to be taking a look at SCA scanning and why it sucks so much. I did a similar video to this around containers, and really the number one issue that I have when it comes to security tooling or findings or getting things remediated is that it's often as though nobody actually tries to fix these findings because so many of the tools are so bad at surfacing developer workflows, how to fix things, what's actually exploitable, all of that stuff. So in this video, I just want to go through an example SCA finding the pain associated with fixing it, and why so much developer time is wasted on these issues that just don't actually matter at all. So by the end of this, I hope you'll have a better idea of what SCA scanning is, as well as what really sucks about it and why developers hate it. Let's start by talking about just how dependencies happen. And this is most common an issue in JavaScript, which is why there are so many SCA scanners that focus on JavaScript, because dependency hell is often what comes from JavaScript first and foremost. Um, because there are so many packages out there to do common things. And so a developer will start in their package JSON and maybe they'll add something or usually this stuff just exists. And this is the problem first and foremost is with shift left tooling, we've spent so much time getting this idea of like, if we can stop the bleeding, then maybe we'll be able to hit a better vulnerability threshold going forward to then be able to tackle a backlog of findings. But they just, this just isn't realistic because let's say that I want to implement some new color and it's some complicated color logic. The first thing I'm going to do as a developer is just search like GitHub colors library JavaScript. And then I find the JavaScript thing I want to use. I go to how, how to install it and it's npm install colors, right? And so when I do something like that, You'll see here that all it did was add the latest version of colors here. And this is why I think so much of, of like this idea of stop the bleeding is so unhelpful because ultimately vulnerabilities arise over time. And when developers install new packages, they just do something like that NPM install, which automatically is going to add the latest version of a library. There's almost never that a developer is like, oh, hold on, I actually want to go through um, NPM and let me find an intentionally old version with a vulnerability that I can use, right? So I can go through here and pretend there's like some old version with a vulnerability. Like developers don't go and intentionally pick old versions of libraries. Instead, they very frequently will just do the NPM install and it gets the latest. How vulnerabilities happen is over time, new vulnerabilities are created. And so I say all that, not because I think it's bad to scan for changes, because um, a lot of tools will, now that I've saved this, I do a get status, you can see that, you know, the package JSON's changed. And so a scanner will go and say, hey, you've added this version of colors and either it's vulnerable or, or it's not. What I'm trying to emphasize is that almost never is that colors or whatever package it is going to be vulnerable because newly introduced packages typically are not vulnerable versions. So that's the first thing to understand is that when you implement an SCA tool, really what you're doing is highlighting all of your organization's tech debt. And that's why it's such a pain because developers have a well understood frustration with tech debt, how it never gets business priority, how difficult it is to get it prioritized. And that same frustration applies to security because instead it's much more likely that in, you know, five years, no one has changed this colors version. And all of a sudden I have to go uh, up several major versions. Things have changed. I have to re-instrument everything and I have to make all these code changes that make this a really hard thing to fix. And so one of the problems out there is trying to stop wasting developer time fixing some stuff like this. And really, there are two approaches here. One is surfacing the fixes, which I think is an important part of it. But just from a pure prioritization standpoint, the reality of security is that you have to make an argument for pitching a fix. And this is the same thing that developers deal with tech debt, is that you have to be able to make an argument to the business about why you should go and tackle tech debt, why it matters. And in the same way, you have to be able to make an argument, hey, we are actually vulnerable because of this finding. So this is the idea of reachability within SCA, is that you can finally show developers like, hey, here are the packages that we need to update because there are actually exploitable vulnerabilities against these packages, and so we need to fix them. Conversely, there's a lot of busy work that happens in SCA, which is why developers get so frustrated with it, is you're basically act asking them to fix tech debt for no reason because I can spend time updating these, but there's no reachable vulnerabilities. And so it, it's just something I'm doing because it's good to do. Like it's still good to patch stuff, but there's not actually any resolution attached to it. So now let's spend some time going through an example of why it's so time consuming to fix some of this stuff and so difficult. I have here a very simple little server JavaScript. 
And all it's doing is intentionally being exploitable with certain packages, right? So I'm importing more packages than I need here. Um, I'm using some transitive dependencies, doing some tricky stuff for scanners just to evaluate those. So if we go through some of these different packages that are being used here, I have a, just a SQL injection, and this is not using a package. This is just a raw SQL injection where the query is getting used to inject directly into the SQL. Here, I'm using a SQL all find all function that has a vulnerability where sanitization doesn't occur correctly on the input. And so unsanitized input flows directly in and it's able to be exploited. Here, this Lodash vulnerability is where you can execute templates directly against the underlying server. I'll show an example of that. This vulnerability is a denial of service vulnerability where complex strings, specifically with this version range function, you're able to exploit that to cause a denial of service where as the complexity of the string increases, the time it takes to process also increases. And then finally, this prototype pollution, where you're able to create new objects directly within the code and use that to then, you know, do all sorts of malicious things from there. And so if I just run this, it's going to run a quick little migration to create a little database. And then if I open it up, you can see here just this very simple thing where we are able to run all of these little exploits. And so here we're able to see exactly what uh, exploitable functions happened, that they were successful, all of that good stuff. And so now we want to go and fix things. And first, from this example, we can see there's, in reality, there's only four things we actually need to fix. It's the Lodash vulnerability, the Semver, the JSON5, and the SQLize vulnerabilities. And here in our console logs, you can actually see things like running list via the template command with Lodash, the object getting passed in, like all of this stuff is getting logged here as well so that we know the attacks were successful. So now if we're just using a regular tool, whether it's like a simple scanner, I'm just using the free version of Sneak here. The enterprise version has some other features, but with this free version, you can see the kinds of noise that gets created for developers, right? Of just this very simple application that's literally just a couple hundred lines of code, we're importing 199 dependencies. And typically what people will do is just start at the top and look for the libraries that have the most high severity findings of what to fix. And so what this would lead me to start doing then as a practitioner is okay, we're going by criticals and highs. I can see that this Babel core has a lot of vulnerabilities of highs and criticals associated with it. And this is probably where I would start. However, you can see that like that actually has nothing to do with any vulnerability that's happening. So essentially I'm asking, hey, let's do this major upgrade for no actual benefit to a developer. And so I would end up wasting time on this one. I would waste time on this. I would waste time on this. This one uh, would actually be a fix. I would waste time on this. So, you know, we're wasting time on three out of the uh, six or so different findings that are up here. So when it comes to actually doing a fix, let's pick this jQuery one because it shows the complexity of trying to pick which version to fix. A lot of tools just give you like this, here's the current version and here's the latest. But the more versions you have to upgrade, the harder the fix is, right? Because if I just look at it, if I want to do this fix, I'm going to have to try to look up the change log between those versions. And honestly, there's not a ton of easy places to try to find this information. So really, I'd have to go through each of these and see which aspects of the API were decommissioned and if I'm using any of them. Ultimately, what a developer would probably do instead of like going through all of these version changes and looking at what was added and removed is just try bumping this to the latest and then try running the application and seeing if it works or not. And the reason this is a problem is because most people's test coverage is not as good as they want. And so here, because we know we're not using jQuery, we're not affected by this change. But the more complex the application is, the harder it's going to be to try to pinpoint what went wrong, if anything went wrong, making these sort of big changes. Like you can see here the number of deprecated functions across all the different versions. And how really, whether or not you have a test for any particular one, I get that we're all supposed to live in this world where every single function has a test to it. But just the reality is it's impossible to know. And um, a lot of times these vulnerabilities happen on dead services where the person's moved on who built it, where no one really knows the status of it. And so you're just opening yourself up to a lot of risk when you make the change. And what's ironic for most businesses, why they hate it, is that the risk of doing this bump is higher than the risk of exploitation because again here i'm not actually using this library anywhere in the code so it's posing zero risk to the business that i'm using it but this little change i'm doing has serious risk because it's opening a lot of unknowns 
uh, to what functionality could break in, causing an outage, all of those things that people are afraid to do. So another feature that Backslash has that's kind of unique is giving you actual recommendations that are contextual to the product. So here we can see the recommendation for jQuery, since I'm not actually using it, is that I should just remove the package, right? This is for all of these unreachable vulnerabilities, is that honestly, I should just get rid of them. In which case here, the tool is totally right. Like these, this is just what I should do. But for ones that are reachable, um, here I have the option to run an upgrade simulation. And immediately you can see just how complex a lot of these upgrades can get. Where in this case, Semver is getting introduced both directly and via SQLize. And the reason both of these things are here is because it's actually pretty complicated which version it would pick. So this old version of Semver is going to end up in the package lock file here. Both the specified version from here is going to get installed and the transitive dependency version from here is going to get installed. And this is where reachability matters, is if I fix this, because I'm calling Semver directly, Backslash will actually make this go away because it knows I'm using this Semver that's coming directly from the imported package. Whereas here it's a transitive dependency and it's not actually getting called. And so even if it's the old version that coexists as a transitive dependency, it won't actually be exploitable um, because I'm not actually executing it anywhere. So that's why this reachability coverage matters for both transitive and direct dependencies. But for here, I just want to upgrade Semver so I can simulate this upgrade and we can see what versions are available to us to upgrade to. So here, this recommendation for Semver is actually a super good example of the options available to me. Um, I can either go to the latest minor version, which is 5.7.2, or I can go to the major version, which is 7.6.3. And so this now would kick off, depending on the developer, they'd either look at, is there any reason besides security we want to update this? Having this ability to choose between options lets me know like, hey, is this worth doing a major thing? So uh, now I would look up the releases here and just take a look at maybe what changed between five to six to seven. But even that's just showing when uh, new patch versions of older ones have been released. So here you can just immediately see some of the difficulties with like trying to even figure out what changed between the different versions. We can see that even version six here is legacy. And so we should really think about um, doing a more major upgrade to version seven as a result of just seeing like, all right, how old is this? Here we pulled up the actual change log where we can go in and see, okay, uh, the move to six was with this intersex logic and it's technically a bug fix, but it changes behavior that may require updating code. So it's marked as a major change up to six. And then if we look at six to seven drops for, for very old note, old versions. All right. So just from looking at these, I can tell that a major upgrade is actually probably what I want to do here. Um, because it seems like the major version change was just them using semantic versioning properly and trying to indicate like, Hey, you might need to do a code change. Uh, you can't just let this patch version ride. And so here I'm going to try going to 7.6.3. So first I'm going to come in and just check out a new branch. Then I'm going to change this to 7.6.3 and I'll change my little resolutions overrides that are in here. Um, and then I'll do an NPM install. And then if I really care, I'm going to come in here and just validate in my lock file that it's all on seven now, which it is. So we should be good here. You'll still see this as a result of the SQLize, which is what backslash highlighted to us here. Um, that this is, Hey, this is also coming in via SQLize. So let's go ahead and take a look at that too. And here there's just a minor patch change that we have to do to fix that back in here and upgrade SQLize, save that do an install and then do a quick test of if all of my stuff is working. So here we can see that the SQLize change actually is using a deprecated function. And this is actually a great example of why uh, these changes end up never actually being that simple because we can see even in this, the way that Sember was doing versioning was that any code change required a major version update. But even here, this is a, a small code change that's required, but it wasn't made super clear without looking at the documentation. You can see here having to go to like the V4 docs because I'm on an old version and it's hard to even find the change log for it. And again, that just speaks to like this simple ticket. When you ask a developer like, hey, I've created a ticket, go ahead and fix this Semver vulnerability. And then say I've even done the work of saying like, okay, this direct dependency is going to be easy for you to update. It should take about one sprint to do the upgrade and check. 
you never know. You're always like one landmine away from, oh, actually, you're going to have to totally update major version upgrades for a core component of the entire application. And that's what makes this stuff so hard is it's so hard to guess some of that stuff, which goes back to why I think this upgrade simulation that's happening here is so important to let people know both, hey, this is coming in both via direct and a transitive dependency. So you're really having to look at both if you're a developer, um, because the alternative is what happens is the developer upgrades this. Uh, they do an NPM install, they deploy the fix, they think they fixed it, but then when they rerun the scanner, it's going to still show an old version of Sember and they're not going to know where it's coming from. And so having both this information and the fix guidance really goes a long way to making things easier for developers. But here you can see, despite that warning, the website still works. But now if we check for the SQL injection, that the, the actual fix is going to require changing the operators. And this gets into some of the difficulties of doing the upgrade, where if I go back to the old version of the docs, and then I find the link of what they're talking about and go in here, and I can see that the code change they're wanting me to make. So here to correct this query, we've had to kind of re-instrument how we're doing the lookup to use the like function instead of doing a direct string operator. Now that that's no longer supported. And now you can see that when we try to run our test, it's no users found instead of uh, looking up all of the users that are there. So this is just an example of um, how complicated some of these specific fixes can be. Where for this, I actually had to do a version upgrade and change some code in order to remediate the vulnerability as opposed to just doing a package upgrade. And so if you think about how undocumented all of these different things are, how difficult it is to look up change logs and what changed, how many major version upgrades to do, there's a lot of decisions that go into upgrading a package. And so the real lesson I want to share for security teams is to just understand that when you cut one of these tickets for a developer with some arbitrary time frame, like if you don't pretend there's no reachability analysis happening, you're just using a scanning tool that only gives you like, look, this has 10 CVSSs. Like, when will this be fixed? A developer is going to waste so much time by probably first looking into every one of these CVEs, figuring out, am I actually vulnerable? Do I actually need an upgrade for it? And then they're going to try to figure out what version should I go to? How do I get there? What changes are going to be necessary? Like it's a very time consuming process. If you don't give clear guidance, that's just saying, hey, here's the specific line of code that's vulnerable. Here's the specific vulnerability that's happening. And here's the, the upgrade paths that are available to you. And you can kind of make the decision as a developer then. You have all the information to at least then just figure out what has to be done, as opposed to trying to do all this guesswork around all these vulnerabilities and sort of getting overwhelmed with the amount of information, which makes fixing taste take even longer. So that was really it for today, besides announcing the new Lacio puppy that's over there. Um, but I hope that you've learned something about SCA scanning just to really give an example of how difficult, really, just like container scanning, it's easy as security to just sort of send all these results to developers and then complain like, why is this taking so long? I don't understand what's happening. When really only more modern tools like Backslash, like some others doing some similar stuff, are able to give people what they need in order to do a better job trying to fix actual findings.